My name is Leslie Riddich. I grew up in Belfast because my parents, both Highlanders, moved there for work when I was age three, then back to Glasgow when I was 13. So I am a Scot. And as a journalist and writer, Scotland is the focus of most of my work. But I've never lost touch with Northern Ireland. In this series, I'm going to explore the relationship between Scotland and Northern Ireland, how it's expressed through community. I think the southern part of Scotland would nearly be like the seventh county. The amount of Northern Irish folk that have moved across. Through language. You would meet somebody every day that you would be talking Ulster Scots to. Through culture and faith. And I'm going to meet people on both sides of the North Channel for whom those things that link Northern Ireland and Scotland are an integral part of their lives, their identity and their future. I don't know if it's Ulster Scots, if it's Scots, if it's Scot Irish or what it is. I don't know what the label is, but there's something there. This is Donad Hillfort in Argyll on the west coast of Scotland. Once the citadel of the kings of Dalriada, whose ancient kingdom straddled the Irish Sea. It's a physical embodiment of the historic links between Scotland and Northern Ireland. It lies at the centre of mainland Scotland's most important archaeological landscape. Over 800 historic monuments, cairns, standing stones and rock art, evidence that for over 5,000 years this has been a significant place. The story of Scotland as a nation begins here, and people from the north of Ireland are credited with being its first kings. So before I start looking at the relationship of Scotland and Northern Ireland today, I'm meeting archaeologist Sharon Webb at Kilmartin Museum to find out more about Donad and its connection to Ulster. So Sharon, what is the significance of Donad? Basically, it is the capital of the Kingdom of Dalriata, um, which was a kingdom that stretched uh, across the whole of Argyll and also into Northern Ireland, mostly the, the county of um, Antrim. We've got quite a lot of fairly high hills in between here and Glasgow and Edinburgh, so the transport links would all been around the sea. It kind of made a lot of sense for that to be one whole kingdom, as it was. The reason we know that this is the capital is related to the carved stone that you can see almost at the summit of Donad, and on the stone is carved a footprint. The footprint is particularly significant because we know from early documentary evidence that part of the inauguration ritual of a king was that they had to place their foot into this footprint because kings were not hereditary, so that ritual kind of sealed the deal, as it were. There was a kind of accepted view that people from Northern Ireland got in their ships and came over and invaded this part of Argyll and then founded the Kingdom of Dalriada. But actually, there's no evidence of an invasion at all. In fact, actually, some of the evidence points to the movement of people going the other way, so from Scotland to Northern Ireland. I kind of wonder myself whether these groups of people living on these two um, bits of land separated by a sea have always had contact because we've got artefacts in our collection that go right back to the Neolithic period 5,000 years ago which come from Antrim from Northern Ireland um, in the form of uh, stone axes which are made of stone that you can only find in Rathlin Island and Northern Ireland. So those contacts have been going on for ages and ages. So to kind of see it as a sort of one-off kind of invasion might, might not make as much sense as to say they already were one people, as it were. It's long been part of the founding myth of Scotland that the first Scottish kings were invaders from the north of Ireland. But Sharon's explanation that the people of Dalriata, both here and in North Antrim, were in fact the same people, 
linked by birth, marriage, culture and language is so much more interesting. In the centuries since then, we've borrowed and embraced cultural traditions from both sides of the North Channel. But if I want to discover whether that's still the case today, then I've got to start with, arguably, Scotland's greatest cultural export, Robert Burns. I know he has an unrivalled place in Scottish culture, but what about in Northern Ireland? Welcome to a hotel outside Belfast for the 130th Belfast Burns Supper. I know that because my father made an address to the same association in 1968. That year they had tin tagus because of an outbreak of foot and mouth disease which led to a ban on all imported meats. So here, half a century later almost, I'm following in his footsteps. And I'm curious to find out whether this Scottish tradition has real vibrancy in Northern Ireland or is perhaps the preserve of a few enthusiasts. It's a knife, see? Rustic labour dicht. Cut you up with very slicht. Trench in your gushing elm trails bricked like on a ditch. And then, oh, what a glorious sicht. Deal tack the hind mist on the drive to all the wheel swell, kites belive and bent like drums. The old good man may slight to arrive, be thank it hums. In return for my supper tonight and following in the family tradition, I've been asked to say a few words of my own about Robert Burns. Well, well thanks very much for the invitation to come here tonight. Um, this phenomenon of gathering every year since, I think, the early 1800s to celebrate one man and think all the time carefully about his poetry is really absolutely unique. There are no Shakespeare suppers. There are no Dylan Thomas teas. There are no Brian Friel feasts. Burns inspires other people to try. I've found that all sorts of people have heard Burns and heard in it ideas, language, vocabulary, that is in them, that would let them have a bit of a go. So here's to another 130 years of the Belfast Burns Association. And for all that he's inspired, ladies and gentlemen, please be upstanding and drink a toast to the immortal memory of Robert Burns. <laughs> Talking to people, I can see there's a real passion for Burns here and a feeling that Burns Night isn't just a Scottish tradition, but an Ulster tradition too. I'm hoping the president of the Belfast Burns Society, John Blair, can tell me more. I feel like I could have been in Scotland tonight. It was that authentic. You're telling me that you could be practically at a Burns supper like this in Northern Ireland any day of the week for a couple of weeks. There's that many suppers now and people's trying to get a night that nobody else has and everybody tries to get a weekend but now there's that many the weekends is all tied up. What is that about? Because you know you're not getting taught burns at school. Is that just a hankering after the old days or is it the music that you love or what is it? Well for me anyway it's the music, the dancing and like where I am I'd be living probably as close to Scotland as would be would be to Belfast. <laughs> Years ago, whenever the farmers burnt the, the barley straw and that there over Pistor and we were able to see that there from home, like. And also where I am there, you can see up right up on the west coast there to Isla. You can see the Paps of Jura, which is roughly 100 miles up on the west coast. You used to listen to me when I was on Radio Scotland. You can hear it. Oh, no problem, yeah. If you actually listen to your own station at times, you'll hear quite a lot of requests from people from Balamina up the north coast there. We can pick it up clearer than what we picked supposedly downtown up around those stations around here. So what does Burns mean to you? Or indeed, what does Burns Night mean to you? And to me, the biggest thing is, is the music, the songs, the songs that he wrote. What would be your favourite song then? I would say a Red Red Rose. Even if I would be maybe playing it myself, you can really picture where he lived or where it was, where he was at the time he wrote it or whatever. And you get this image of him 
in your head whenever you're, you're playing that particular song anyway, or that tune. And to me, that's the one that really it, it takes you back. As, as feisty and authentic a night, a burn supper, as I've encountered anywhere, actually. Um, I'm hearing from people around me that there are dozens of burn suppers going on. I'm hearing all the time about how much music is bringing people backwards and forwards from Scotland to Northern Ireland. And people's easy reference points in Scottish culture is really quite astonishing to find here in Northern Ireland. Um, the crack has been brilliant, the music is really strong, and there's a sort of easy familiarity with people, um, which is, is what the essence of a burn supper is all about. So it's been a fantastic night here and a bit of an eye-opener. I'm sure they'll forgive me for saying that the average age at the supper was on the high side. Maybe that's always the case at formal occasions like these. But where does the future of these Scottish cultural traditions lie in Northern Ireland? Are young folks so interested in Scottish music and dance? <laughs> to find out, I'm travelling to County Tyrone to visit the Solace Centre in Brady, a community centre with an Ulster Scots ethos. It's also home to the Solace Highland Dancers, winners of UK and European championships their commitment and talent has taken them round the world. James, we're sitting not on the coast facing Scotland. We're in an area that's, that's famous for the O'Neills. Why here is there an Ulster Scots centre? The O'Neill dynasty basically finished when the plantation arrived here and in this area it was predominantly Scottish planters that were planted here back in the early 1600s and ever since that the names that arrived from Scotland then are still prevalent here today like Rankin, Campbell, my surname is Key which I believe come from Clan Mackay so that's where the Scottishness has come from right back to the plantation to the present day. First. Second. And there's a new generation here just as enthusiastic about their Scottish culture. James' daughter, Georgina, runs Highland dance classes for more than 500 pupils every week. You have learnt Highland dancing, you're an accomplished dancer, you teach it. Um, why Highland dancing and not Irish dancing or any other kind? Well, everybody was always in the pipe bands in this community. It was just a, something that happened in all the rural areas around here. Um, I started off as a drum major and then as a piper. As a young girl, you wanted to dance. And you always seen Irish dancers here, there and everywhere. They were everywhere here. But Highland dancing was so different, yet they wore the tartan, they used the music that we knew so well. So it was like that cultural connection, but had like the girly side of dance kind of thing that we looked for. Ma. Ma. So there was no teachers in Northern Ireland. We got a girl called Misha Dodds, who's from Fife, and she travelled across here every weekend for nine years to teach us to dance. Now full points and get your knees out. She would have flew here maybe on a Friday, taught us all day on a Saturday, took me back with her, competed all day on a Sunday took me to auditions, she trained me up and put me through all my teaching exams. And that's what built up the Highland dance scene and the competitions then here as well. But you must have had no boyfriends, no life, no homework. You must have done nothing but spend much of your youth going backwards and forwards to Scotland every weekend. When I was part of the Edinburgh Tattoo team, it was every weekend from February to August, I was in Edinburgh every weekend. Do you see yourself as Scots? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my dad was a member of the Orange Institution and most of the local Orange halls in the Stavane district, there was a pipe band that would have uh, been part and parcel of that community. So you've got, you're surrounded by the skirl of the Highland bagpipes, you're dressing up in tartan, so that Scottishness was there 
from a very early age. It's who we are, it's our tradition. I have grown now to an age that I am proud to tell the story that I'm an Ulster Scots, I'm Scots-Irish, uh, and I always say that if I'm going to a football match in Scotland, for example, and I get off the ferry in Stranraer, the hair standing on the back of your neck, it's the only way I can describe it to, to say, look, this feels like home. As Daddy says, Scotland feels like home. It really does. It's like a wee home from home. And you get so many friends in Scotland and there's so many judges and dancers and we're always coming and going and they're always coming and going. So I don't know if it's Ulster Scots, if it's Scots, if it's Scott Irish or what it is. I don't know what the label is, but there's something there. It's something in us. Well, there's no doubting the energy in that room and the way that the enthusiasm of one family at the centre of it, the Keys, has kind of spread into the whole community to pull them in, not just to the piping or the dancing, but to a kind of Scottishness. It's evident that people feel Scottish, and so far from Scotland, that's absolutely astonishing. Somewhere with a much closer geographical proximity to Scotland is Cushendall on the north coast of Antrim. It was once part of the Kingdom of Dalriada, ruled from Donad in Argyll, where my journey began. The connections between this part of Northern Ireland and Scotland run deep, but they aren't the same as those in Brady. Cushendall is a place steeped in Irish culture, language and Gaelic games. A mile above the town are the remains of Laid Church. Dating from the medieval period, the parish is said to be named after a Scottish lady called Lydia, who eloped here with her lover. Its original parishioners were Roman Catholic, but after the Reformation, it became an Anglican place of worship. For centuries, Laid Church was the chief burial place of the MacDonalds, who came across from Scotland in the 14th century and ruled this part of Antrim for generations. And the names inscribed on the headstones, Hamiltons, Macaulays, MacDonalds and McAllisters, are both Irish and Scottish. Families with roots in both nations. For broadcaster and County Antrim man Liam Logan, it's the very complexity of the Scottish-Irish connection and how that's fed into the language to Ulster Scots that particularly interests him. Liam, can you tell me something about the connection then between the glens of Antrim here and the west coast of Scotland? Well, first of all, Leslie, you only get to look at the water there and you can see Scotland. People certainly have been going back and forth or that bit of water for not hundreds of years, thousands of years. If we look at your own background though, Liam, you're not, if, in a sense, born into the traditions you would expect that would lead you to such an interest in Ulster Scots. I mean, you're from a Catholic background yourself. I think it's worth noting that language uh, doesn't recognise political or, or religious differences. I'm an enthusiast. I'm somebody that likes Ulster Scots. I like the fact that uh, uh, there are particular words and particular phrases that uh, enliven the way we speak. And I think that's what makes us different. And my own introduction to Ulster Scots came through a, a family friend called Alec Catherwood. And I saw his name right down. I said to him, I said, hello on a minute. I says, you're called Catherwood, but it says there your name is Calderwood. And I look back on it now and it, it, it gave me a, a very prescient, a very far-sighted explanation as to why that should be. He said they're both right. That's not a very Northern Ireland thing to say. <laughs> he then pointed out that the people I knew up the road called Elliot were in fact the Elliots. The people I knew who lived down the road that we knew as the Caffles were actually the Caulfields. And the people over the road that were his relations, he was married onto them. We knew them as the Eggiesons, but they were in fact the Atkinsons. So I thought it was peculiar. I mean, I, 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 I learned then that, that there was a northerness about the written word and the spoken word, and I think that's at the heart of Ulster Scots. 
Ulster Scots isn't something everyone in the Glens will identify with, but the Scots' lilt of their accent and the words they use certainly straddle both cultural traditions here. It's there in many of the shared words, but the shared words aren't all exclusively Scots. The old alliance meant that there was quite a number of French words brought in. My favourite is footer. Footer, that comes from a medieval French word called foutre. So this is part of what's important about Ulster Scots and language in general. It is not a series of words chiselled onto a granite slab. It's a changing thing. I think that's why it's relevant still today. Not that we use every single word that we speak as an Ulster Scots word, but sometimes the mot juste is an Ulster Scots word. So remember that the next time you're footering about. And how do you feel about Irish, Gaelic, Scots, Gaelic? I mean, we're sitting here between all sorts of streams of language. People talk about Ulster Scots as being the great link between Scotland and Ulster and Ulster and Scotland. But that's not really the full story. There is a story there which is about Scots Gaelic and Irish Gaelic. And they're also common tongues, both sides of that shuck. There are a number of linguistic rivers that flow into Ulster. Uh, I mean, we've got uh, all the folk coming out here with King Billy. So there is an Ulster Dutch tradition. There is uh, uh, the Huguenots who were persecuted out of France and they came over and they brought a lot of their language. And if people get a, an interest in a word, if they have a gra for a particular word that appeals to them, that fits well in their myth, they're going to take it no matter where it comes from. I, I suggest to you that uh, people actually enjoy that fact that uh, there are many tongues. By drawing attention to the way Ulster Scots has borrowed from other languages, how it cuts across political and cultural divides, Liam is challenging the notion that it's somehow the preserve of one community over another. In East Belfast, Linda Irvine is also confronting long-held prejudices about language and who it belongs to. In 2011, she set up Tourus, an Irish language project that has more than 120 students and 10 classes a week, something that would have been quite unthinkable when I was a girl growing up in East Belfast. Couple of rattles at the hall, way the canter. I was sitting here in Loyalist East Belfast. It doesn't feel as if Gaelic is part of this tradition or of this place. No, it doesn't, but if you also realise that the townland here is called Ballymacarrett, townland of the Son of Art, which of course is a Gaelic place name. We have more Gaelic place names, I'm told, here in East Belfast than there are in West Belfast. When I started on my journey, on my tourists of learning the language, these were the things that I started to learn our townland names, our place names, our surnames, many of the words that we use in our everyday speech are from Gaelic. When you went to those first Irish language classes, did you feel a bit of an outsider? I suppose I did at first, yes. I mean, I, at that time, through my own ignorance, I regarded it, I suppose, as many people do, as a, a Catholic language. Once you have a deeper understanding and a realisation of the true heritage of the language. And when I look at Gaelic now and I understand that, you know, it was spoken in all of Ireland, in the Isle of Man and in most of Scotland. There's words I see on, on your board there that actually link Scots and Gaelic and Gaelic. Like the Scots word uh, for a jumper is a gansey, and then it's the Irish word, and it's the Scots Gaelic word. So there's all those links. What's your own background that's brought you in to, to learning Irish or Gaelic? We lost out in the state schools because Irish was never taught. And somehow I just almost felt deprived that this was a language all around us and all our place names and all. Every place we go to, every town, it's there. And I even saw my mother, who's now 90, words she uses 
are actually Irish words, and I think it's such a shame we lost that. I had a poem which was macaronic, both in English and Irish, and I went looking to get the Ulster Scots of it, and in fact I came up here asking for the Ulster Scots of it, and Linda, she said to me, she says, uh, I could teach you the Irish of it. So that's how I basically was introduced to come here. I came, to, I came looking for Ulster Scots and I ended up learning Irish. <laughs> I think the attraction too is uh, not identified as belonging to one political party or nationality or Protestant or Catholic or Unionist or whatever uh, when you're uh, learning your Irish in this, the surroundings here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's the uh, particular beauty of it. This cautiousness about language, religion and politics simply doesn't exist in Scotland, where Gaelic is spoken by people of all religions and none, and of every political persuasion. I've been over in, in sort of the west coast of Scotland a number of times. I almost felt a sadness because I saw people in Scotland with the music, with the language, you know, they're Gaelic people, but they're Presbyterian people. And they were able to enjoy their Scottishness, you know, enjoy being a Gael. It's been denied to me because of my religion. And yet, because of their, you know, position and their religion, they do have it. I want people in Northern Ireland, they understand that this is not about being Irish. It's not about being Catholic. It's not about being political. It's something that belongs to us all. Tell me a bit about the connection that you're making, really, between Irish Gaelic and Ulster Scots. Up until I started learning Irish, I had no interest in Ulster Scots. I thought it was a bit of a joke. And then it was people in the Irish Diamonds community who challenged me and said, no, you need to look at this again. And I met Scots speakers and I, you know, I met Ulster Scots people. And, you know, I started to recognise the beauty of it and the history of it too. And I also realised, of course, that it's full of Gaelic. And, you know, Gaelic is borrowed into Scots and Scots is borrowed into Gaelic. So there's that lovely crossover and that overlap. And again, I, I think it's sad in Northern Ireland that, you know, we're always trying to divide things up into little boxes and they don't divide up as neatly as that. So for me, you know, Scots, Ulster Scots, Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic, they're things that impact our English every day here in Northern Ireland. So it's something that we should be able to all embrace and all enjoy. What's fascinating about Linda is that her links with Scotland are not about her family, they're about language. And they're not about the language you'd expect. It's not Ulster Scots, it's Gaelic and Gaelic. And there's a wistfulness there about the ease with which Scots Gaelic speakers sit within their own tradition and the politics of the country. Maybe that's something that Linda would like to see happening here in Northern Ireland too. I feel like I've only just dipped my toe into the cultural connections between Northern Ireland and Scotland. There's so much more to be told, but what I've already learned is that it's a much richer, more diverse and more vibrant and relevant connection than I imagined. And a special relationship continues at the same time next Sunday evening here on BBC Two Northern Ireland.